Okay, this lecture is going to focus on a couple different types of inflammatory bowel disease, primarily Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Just a general overview of the two diseases. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere in the GI tract, um, and ulcerative colitis is mostly reserved for the large bowel or the colon and the rectum. Uh, so Crohn's is an autoimmune disease that again, can affect any part of the GI tract. The ileocecal area is the most common, but as far as involvement, this is kind of what you might see as percentages of, of what people would get for Crohn's. Um, we don't really know exactly what causes Crohn's. There's just like a lot of um, autoimmune dis diseases, we don't know for sure what, what causes people to get them, but there's likely a genetic component of some sort. Symptoms of Crohn's are um, anything GI related, it's probably fair game. Abdominal pain, diarrhea are probably the two most common things. And then bleeding, uh, minimal bleeding is really common, um, small amounts of blood. Gross bleeding is significant and sign of maybe a fistula or, or an advanced type of colitis. Fistulas are connections between two epithelial lined organs. So basically two parts of the bowel end up sort of uh, getting, you get enough inflammation and it sort of wears down the lining and they create a communication between the two. Um, basically anyone with Crohn's after 10 to 20 years of disease, it's about a 50%, up to a 50% chance that they can have a fistula. Um, these can be asymptomatic. If you think about where it might be, it might not matter. Like if it's in the small intestine, two parts of the small intestine touching each other, it, likely not a big deal. Um, but certainly you could have much more problematic situations, for example, um, into the bladder or the vagina or um, uh, the rectum, you know, interfering, com communicating with like the small bowel or something like that. You'd have uh, significant issues with, with that particular fistula versus other ones. So it really depends on how significant it was. And that's going to be more of a surgical oper um, option to treat those particular fistulas. Uh, systemic compl complications, so think about this as affecting the GI tract and all those symptoms being pretty miserable to live with, but there's a lot of other complications too. Fatigue, weight loss, especially with uh, malnutrition or obstructed bowel. Um, you also have some other things that kind of blur into some of the other autoimmune diseases we talked about. So psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease also can cause some arthritic components as well. With Crohn's, you can also have ophthalmic uh, inflammation. Uh, skin involvement, um, hypercoagulability, osteoporosis, anemias, and pulmonary issues. So you, you can have a fair amount of systems affected by Crohn's disease uh, in severe cases. So choosing your therapy is mostly going to depend on the disease severity, the anatomic location, and your goal of therapy. Whether you want to induce uh, or um, you're trying to just get somebody on a maintenance regimen, um, or you want to get somebody into remission. And the goal is always remission, but it sort of depends on where you're starting. Um, the symptoms you want to target is number of liquid soft stools per day, minimizing that, uh, minimizing abdominal pain, giving people just a general sense of well-being and quality of life, um, minimizing the complications like arthritis, problems like fistulas. Um, and then, of course, some th sometimes stuff like this, um, Crohn's complications can cause a septic-like situation, an intra-abdominal infection, and ultimately can cause sepsis as well. So making sure that people aren't getting to that point. It's kind of the pyramid of Crohn's disease. You have our um, top drugs, which are going to be the investigationals or your TNF alpha agents. And then you have these kind of in the middle with steroids and other maybe oral immune suppressions, like this is spelled wrong, but methotrexate is going to come back into play here. And then you might have some other things that are more directly focused on specific areas of the body. So we're going to talk about these different ones here. Just like all other autoimmune diseases, I think there's sort of this ongoing debate on what the best method to do. Do you start with a basic approach to Crohn's disease and work your way up the pyramid? Or do you start with a more broad spectrum immunologic uh, suppression and then add on things if you need to? Um, certainly there's a cost perspective. We talked about how expensive the biologic agents are. So we'll talk about these different uh, theories here. Okay, so starting with patients with low risk, mild symptomatic Crohn's disease. So these are patients, again, mild disease, uh, generally speaking, low risk to have complications. 
And so you're looking at a couple different things. So is the disease limited to the ileum or proximal colon? Yes or no? Um, if it is, you can start with uh, topical steroids. So when I say topical, when I look at budesonide, the reason I'm saying that's topical is because budesonide doesn't really absorb out of the GI tract. If you give somebody um, a tablet or a capsule of budesonide, it's just going to stay within the GI tract. So it's getting the steroid, the anti-inflammatory effect directly to the site you need it, and it's going to leave it right there. So it's a nice option for patients with mild disease because they won't really have any systemic steroid side effects using budesonide. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second here. So if not, does the disease involve either the colon diffusely or the distal colon? If it does, you get a little bit more broad spectrum steroids. So you go with prednisone 40 milligrams. Uh, and then let's continue down this pathway since we're over here. And does the patient initially respond to the treatment? Yes, you want to taper. No, refer to management of moderate. So at that point, if they aren't responding to a prednisone burst, then you're going to say, this is not mild Crohn's disease. This is something more severe than that. And you want to limit their overall steroid burden if they are responding well to it. Um, if the budesonide, let's see, so if they respond to budesonide, you want to taper that off. If not, then again, that goes to a moderate disease. And if you taper it and the symptoms flare, you want to restart the budesonide. Uh, and there's a couple other options you could consider starting. If not, then you just monitor for disease and then maybe do a colonoscopy in 6 to 12 months and see. So it's pretty basic. It focuses mostly on steroid therapy, and it depends on how significant the disease is, whether you're going to use budesonide, the topical approach, or prednisone, the more systemic approach. And then if, if those are failing, that pushes you pretty quickly into the more moderate to severe Crohn's disease category. But let's just talk about glucocorticoids quick and our options. So we've got prednisone, which is 40 to 60 milligrams per day is what you'd start at. And then, of course, you'd taper once you, know, you get your symptoms under control. Budesonide, remember, you might remember this from the pulmonary lecture. So pulmacort is actually budesonide, that's an inhaler. Um, and what people did for a while was they actually used the nebulizer solution, which was a nebulized form of budesonide, and they would take it orally to get that topical corticosteroid effect. When um, some companies started making actually a tablet or a capsule that sort of replaced that, but um, that was how this started. Um, the capsules were pretty expensive. There's some generic equivalents out right now. Eucerus is the brand name. They aren't really cheap because they aren't you know, super common drugs. There's not a lot of manufacturers that actually make them, but it's uh, you know an option out there. Talking about a couple other, before we go on to some of the more moderate therapies, I just want to talk about a couple other things that aren't super common for Crohn's, but um, I wanted to mention them now because they could be used uh, more common for ulcerative colitis. These are the 5-ASA drugs or amino salicylates. We don't really fully understand the mechanism of these drugs, but they're kind of aspirin or NSAID type analogs. I like to think about them like that. You take them, they get into the GI tract. There's bacteria in your GI tract that actually cleave them and turn them into an active form, which you can then, uh, which then go on to promote anti-inflammatory effects. I think that's probably the most basic way to look at it. Um, there's a lot of different formulations. There's oral, most of them are oral tablets or capsules. You have to take them frequently throughout the day to be effective, usually like up to four times a day in some. There are some longer acting formulations out there too, but for the most part, you're looking at a more frequent administration frequency. And there's also enemas. So you could do uh, an enema rectally and get it better to that site of action if that's where people are having specific symptoms. Again, for Crohn's, a lot of people say don't even bother with these because this doesn't really make any sense and it's mostly just for ulcerative colitis. And that's probably where I'm going to leave this. So for the Crohn's algorithm, we're going to skip these for now and, and we'll come back to them for UC. Um, just to mention them briefly, there's a couple different ones here. Um, you've got uh, a couple different, a bunch of different formulations. I don't really care you know what these come as, just that sulfasalazine and mesalamine are 5-ASA drugs. That's all I really care about, you know, for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, antibiotic therapy hasn't really been useful beyond maybe some initial therapy type things. There's some modest benefit in clinical trials. Um, and this is not like talking about somebody who's actively septic. Of course, you'd give that person antibiotics. But this is somebody who uh, might have mild disease or modest disease and use a sort of a suppressive therapy as a chronic option. So metronidazole and ciprofloxacin have been used 
And um, but the problem with giving antibiotics long term is they aren't really ever studied like that. So you're taking a little bit of a risk when you do that, and you don't really know if people are going to get more substantial side effects over time. So metronidazole, for example, short term use has very few side effects. Long term use actually has permanent peripheral neuropathy associated with it. So it's not necessarily the safest option to try. Um, durations really all over the place from one to six months in different trials too. So again, I don't really care we talk about those because they, they've sort of fallen out of favor from, from what I can understand now. Okay, so um, treating mild to moderate active disease, we just talked about that, that algorithm at the beginning, and that's basically what I'd want you to know. You're going to focus mostly on your topical. Remember, by when I say topical glucocorticoids, I'm talking about budesonide. Um, if somebody has more severe disease and it's not responding to that, prednisone um, is probably going to be where you're going to go. And after that, you're going to be looking at um, uh, probably escalating it further to a more moderate severe, which is where the anti-TNF agents are going to come back into play. Now, ileitis and colitis, if you did have somebody with Crohn's disease very limited to um, the distal bowel, portions of the bowel, then you could maybe get away with some of the things we just talked about, like the 5-ASA drugs or possibly antibiotics. But that would be a very rare case. And again, that's going to be mostly ulcerative colitis patients we're going to use those in. So once you've achieved remission, you could just taper off your steroid or whatever after 6 to 12 months. Um, or sorry, so if you, excuse me, I'm reading my slides around here. If you if you got somebody to remission with a 5-ASA drug, again, going to be pretty rare with Crohn's. This would be more a UC type picture. You could try it after 6 to 12 months and getting rid of it. Um, with budesonide, you can taper it after 12 weeks, and um, but you may need to re-escalate therapy if the patient is having issues with tapering off the drug. Okay, let's move on to more severe disease. So again, this is basically patients who aren't responding to some sort of a steroid. And um, there's a couple different ways you can approach this. Hospitalization could be you know, the worst case scenario. So severe symptoms, toxic appearing. These patients are septic, so we're gonna give them anti aggressive antibiotics, IV steroids. And then once stabilized, we're gonna focus to some sort of an outpatient friendly regimen, but that's gonna be the moderate to severe disease category. So, um, there's just some definitions there, but anyway, uh, that we've already kind of talked about those. So we're really focusing on immunomodulators and biologics or some sort of combination. And so we're back to our old drugs here. Methotrexate is going to come back into play, just like with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, azathioprine is, um, you might remember from our transplant lectures, is a drug used as a um, re anti-rejection med but uh, has been used in Crohn's historically. We don't really use this anymore for Crohn's, but it, I put it in here as a historical marker. The biologics, these are the anti-TNF agents that come into play. So infliximab, Remicade, uh, was originally the first one that came out for Crohn's disease. So remember, that's the IV only one, so it's a little bit trickier to administer it. You have to go into an infusion center to get it. And there's adalimumab or Humira, which we've talked about already, which is sub-Q. There's a specific one called Simzia or Sirtolibzumab, which is a uh, option that's approved only for Crohn's disease. Uh, but they're all TNF agents. I think we talked about this before, but just to reiterate, uh, the drugs uh, work by um, inhibiting tumor necrosis factor alpha, so they prevent it from interacting with the TNF alpha receptor, which then um, prevents a number of downstream effects from happening, which sort of um, uh, work uh, specifically with the immune system response and inflammatory responses. So cellular apoptosis, production of inflammatory cytokines, uh, apoptosis of macrophages, increased expression of cell adhesion molecules. So all these things don't happen as frequently with the TNF agent, therefore your disease isn't as uh, beholden to your immune system's overactive response. Other therapies you can use, mycophenolate. Uh, if you remember, that's sort of in the same category as azothioprine from a transplant drug, so it makes sense that you can use it here. However, they've seen relapse with that at about 18 months. Um, it is an azothioprine 
alternative if you wanted to give something oral. And there's a bunch of other biologics. You get to the point with these autoimmune diseases where all the biologics sort of blend together. And that's because they all kind of do the same thing where they're immune suppression. And if you have an autoimmune disease and you're suppressing the immune system, it should have some positive effects on that specific disease. The question is how substantial of a of a immune suppression effect can you get away with and still have the patient, you know, not getting colds and, and other diseases regularly, infectious diseases regularly. So that's why the TNF agents are generally preferred. They're very well tolerated compared to some of these other ones, which are going to be maybe a little bit more broad spectrum. However, there are newer drugs that actually might go the opposite direction. So something like velolizumab or Antivio is a new medication that is an integrin receptor antagonist. It's a novel mechanism for Crohn's and it was more recently approved. So you might see some of these newer drugs come out that actually have maybe a better approach to the drug. So this is again, autoimmune disease. I can't stress enough with the biologic agents that are being used for it is one of the, the few areas of medicine that, that changes very rapidly uh, as we get more and more information on what drugs work. And of course, there's always things investigational. Biologic targets are a big uh, drug company um, area of research right now. So we'll see more of that stuff in our careers for sure. And of course, there are surgical options too, bowel resectomy, um, excuse me, bowel resections and colectomies uh, could be done as well. So just to sort of review what we might do for a patient with moderate to severe Crohn's, we would induce them first. So the combination therapy is usually preferred. Uh, patients are going to generally start with moderate to severe, they're going to start on a tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitor, so a TNF inhibitor, plus you're going to give them azathioprine. Um, methotrexate can be used in this category, but um, methotrexate is only generally given to younger male patients as azathioprine can have some long-term fertility impact on young men. So you're going to be on a combination therapy, which this is quite a bit different than rheumatoid arthritis. So we're basically just start on regular methotrexate. Here you're using the TNF agent plus your azathioprine or methotrexate. A 30-week trial um, in New England Journal fair, uh, favored steroid-free remission at 26 weeks with combination versus either agent alone. So we actually have some good data to show that the combination of these two strategies works better than one of them by themselves. Um, Anti-TNF. Monotherapy is acceptable. It is effective. For patients over 60, they might respond fine to it, or they might not have quite as um, bad of side effects with the other drugs. Um, again, young males, if you had a patient who you wanted to um, you want to avoid the side effects of azathioprine in, that would be a good option. And I just realized that I said this is uh, because young men um, are at risk for fertility. That's not true. I was thinking of a different drug. Apologize for mistaking. If you go back to my other slide, you can see the, the reason rationale there. We can just flip back quick because I think I glossed over this a little bit. Um, but it's the hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma in young men with, uh, with long-term use. So it does have an increased risk of malignancy amongst younger male patients. Okay. Um, and then alternate options, again, there's lots of other MABs you can consider, but basically you're going to go with your TNF agent uh, plus this and, and go with that core, and you probably aren't going to deviate much from that for, for most patients. Um, after this, you're going to continue your TNF biologic indefinitely, probably for maintenance. Uh, confirm drug trough levels to optimize therapy. You can get levels to make sure everything looks good. You want to stop your azathioprine after 12 to 24 months. Uh, confirm mucosal healing. Uh, and, and remission histologically. Other options, you could continue azathioprine or methotrexate monotherapy. However, it's been shown to be less helpful for um, than uh, continuing the tumor necrosis factor agent indefinitely. So basically for moderate to severe disease, big difference between mild disease is you're on a drug for life at this point. So um, you, that's uh, going to be something to consider, especially injections chronically for, for, you know, as long as we probably have those drugs until something maybe better comes out that's more convenient to do. Okay, switching gears to ulcerative colitis. You have uh, recurring episodes of inflammation limited to mucosal layers of the colon, rectal involvement, uh, similar type of effects as Crohn's disease. 
disease severity, so you got mild, moderate, and severe. Basically, it, it depends on how, my, how many loose stools and how much blood is in the stools, and then also what other things are going on. So systemic toxicity as well. Mild to moderate treatment focusing on proctitis or proctosigmoiditis. You're going to look at topical 5-ASA drugs. So these are going to be things like mesalamine suppositories or enemas. Um, hydrocortisone foam and suppositories are also options. So you can give uh, a product like this directly to the area where you're getting the most inflammation. And um, oral 5-ASA drugs uh, could be used too. And you could also combine them. So you could give an oral 5-ASA drug and a topical one. So that way you're kind of, I think, about approaching it from both sides. And your maintenance of remission, um, if you have one relapse per year, you're going to be looking at just a 5-ASA enema or suppository every night at bedtime. If you have multiple relapses, you're probably be, going to be on a, an oral 5-ASA drug for long-term therapy. Mild to moderate treatment, left-sided extensive or pan colitis, you're going to just go straight to the orals. You could certainly combine with the rectal formulations as well. There's no problem with that. Although, you know, rectal formulations obviously are tricky for people to do and people generally probably don't like administering them. So it could be compliance problems with recommending that. So oral might just be the way to go. If somebody fails this 5-ASA regimen, you're probably going to be looking at glucocorticoids, Maintenance of remission, um, combination of oral rectal products, uh, tapering your glucocorticoids once the patient is stable for four to two to four weeks as well. Uh, refractory to any of these therapies, and you're basically going to go to your Crohn's algorithm, your, your higher or your moderate to severe Crohn's, and look at tumor necrosis factor alpha agents. Um, there's also the drug tofacitinab or Zelgens, which I think we talked about before. So there's a couple options for that. Again, here, this just spells it out a little bit more for severe treatment. Um, if somebody has severe ulcerative colitis, oral corticoids, high dose 5-ASA, if they have systemic toxicity, you're going to admit them and probably treat them for sepsis. So that's going to be fluids, electrolytes, um, broad spectrum antibiotics, and uh, maybe even IV steroids. So a couple different options there. Uh, fulminant colitis is a subgroup of patients with really severe ulcerative colitis, and the treatment is essentially like a, a sepsis type treatment, hospital admission, broad spectrum antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and probably maybe even a surgical evaluation or intervention. All right, irritable bowel syndrome, um, not really an autoimmune thing that I know of. At least I don't know if there's any real definition for this other than just recurrent abdominal pain or discomfort greater than three days a month. I guess you could say maybe it could, could be a precursor. If somebody is having these symptoms, it might be indicative that they could have early Crohn's or early um, ulcerative colitis. So it could be something like that. But for most part, people who have um, this particular set of symptoms are going to improve with much less significant or less severe treatment options. So for mild to intermittent symptoms, we don't do pharmacology or pharmac pharmacotherapy, um, just lifestyle diet modification, exclusion of gas producing foods, lactose gluten testing or intolerance, however you want to approach that. Failure to respond to those things, you're going to look at psyllium or bulk forming products, Miralax or PEG, um, refractory to the above. We talked about lubiprostone and linaclotide. Uh, which could be options for IBS patients. And then if you have abdominal pain, I don't know how much I've talked about dicyclamine. I kind of forget if I mentioned this one before, but it's an anticholinergic, antispasmodic agent that can work acutely for acute pain. It's not something you'd take chronically, but if somebody is having a lot of issues while they're trying to maybe, I don't know, get another medication to respond, it could be a choice for them. So if you have a persistent pain despite this, so if people are, you know, coming back to your clinic multiple times asking for Bentil refills or dicyclamine refills, <clears throat> there are some longer acting medications. And some of the medications that have been trialed have been tricyclic antidepressants, which are anticholinergic, plus they might have some anti-analgesic um, properties. They're used for neuropathic pain. Um, so we do tend to try those in these patients. Um, if diarrhea is a prominent symptom, you could try loperamide or um, bile acid sequestrants which aren't used very often and generally speaking you never really go to antibiotics with IBS it's not indicated unless there's a specific reason or you did a stool culture and then you know you obviously found a pathogen that'd be a different story altogether so um, that's just IBS in a nutshell um, so that's the end of the lecture thanks